We are living in unprecedented times, not just because of the pandemic, but also because we have seen the ugly head of racism rise in our nation. Truly, it is America's constant curse. But we have reason to hope. Young peaceful protesters all around the world are teaching us that it is not just enough to not be a racist. This generation is teaching us that we must engage in anti-racist behaviors and practices. This series on anti-racism is designed to encourage a national dialogue on how we engage in anti-racist behaviors and practices when focusing on our teaching, our research, and our outreach to schools, communities, businesses, and industries. We will explore and discuss how we do so in a way that respects the communities we have the privilege of working with each and every day. This prompted by the belief that black and brown lives matter as much as anyone else's life. Being anti-racist is fighting against racism. Drawing directly from the Smithsonian Institute's website on anti-racism, racism takes several forms and works most often with at least one other form to reinforce racist ideas, behavior, and policy. There are four types of racism, individual, interpersonal, institutional, and structural. Individual racism refers to the beliefs and actions of individuals that support or perpetuates racism in conscious and unconscious ways. The U.S. cultural narrative about racism typically fo focuses on individual racism and fails to recognize systemic racism. Examples of individual racism include believing in the superiority of white people or telling a racist joke. The second form of racism is interpersonal racism, which occurs between individuals. These are public expressions of racism often involving slurs, biases, or hateful words or actions. The third form of racism is institutional racism, which occurs in an organization. These are discriminatory treatments, unfair policies, or biased practices that result in inequitable outcomes for whites over people of color and extend considerably beyond prejudice. These institutional policies often never mention any racial group, but the intent is to create advantages. An example of institutional racism occurs in the public school system in which most students are non-white, but are taught by mostly white teachers who are not all anti-racist. On the other hand, rich neighborhoods are more likely to have better teachers, less students and teachers of color, and more money for education. The fourth form of racism is structural racism. Structural racism is the overarching system of racial bias across institutions and society. These systems give privileges to white people resulting in disadvantages to people of color. An example of structural racism is stereotyping all people of color as criminals. It is not enough to say you are not racist. You need to be anti-racist. In the words of author Ibram Kendi, being anti-racist is a radical choice in the face of history requiring a radical reorientation of our consciousness. Being anti-racist results from a conscious decision to make frequent, consistent, equitable choices daily. These choices require ongoing self-awareness and self-reflection as we move through life. Thank you for joining us for this afternoon session on anti-racism. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Sarah Helfrich and I'm the Senior Associate Dean of the Patton College. I'll be your moderator for today's discussion, the misrepresentation of people of, people of color in research.
This discussion, which focuses on how people of color are represented in research, is the fifth of a six-part series on anti-racism sponsored by Ohio University's Patton College of Education. As we get started, let me start by letting you know that today's event is being recorded and a recording of the session will live on the Patton College YouTube channel. Also, let me provide a few instructions for participation. First, we invite you to place any questions you may have for the panelists in the chat, and we will get to as many questions as we have time for. That said, due to the limited time we have together today, we may not get to all of your questions. Second, at the end of the session, an evaluation will be placed in the chat. We encourage you to take a few minutes when the event concludes to provide us with feedback about your experience. Before introducing our panelists, I would like to take a moment to thank Dr. Theda Gibbs Gray, Assistant Professor in Teacher Education. Her help and guidance were integral in forming today's panel. With that said, let's jump into our discussion. Our panelists for today's event are Dr. Adrian Irby, Assistant Professor in the Department of Counseling and Higher Education in the Patton College. Dr. Irby earned her doctorate in counseling with a multicultural counseling cognate from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Her research focuses on multicultural and social justice issues in counseling and counselor education, including racial, cultural, and LGBTQ issues, intersectionality, identity development, and educational practices fostering cultural competence. Dr. Irby's recent, recent publications have appeared in journals including the International Journal for Transgender Health, the Journal for Specialists in Group Work, Counseling Outcome Research and Evaluation, and the Journal of Homosexuality. Dr. Emmanuel Jean-Francois is an Associate Professor in the Department of Educational Studies in the Patton College, where he specializes in comparative and international education. He is the coordinator of the doctoral program in educational leadership, as well as the doctoral specialization in comparative and international educational leadership. He earned his doctorate in curriculum and instruction, specializing on adult higher education and human resources development from the University of South Florida. Dr. Jean-Francois is the former president of the Transnational Education and Learning Society, a former editor of the peer-reviewed journal, Human Services Today, and the current editor of the online peer-reviewed journal, The African Symposium. Dr. Ada Ward-Randolph is a professor also in the Department of Educational Studies in the Patton College, where she specializes in qualitative methodology and the history of education. She earned her doctorate in educational policy and leadership with concentrations in African American and women's education history, urban education policy, race, class, and gender studies, curriculum studies, and qualitative methodology from The Ohio State University. Her research is focused on African American teachers and principals in urban communities. Dr. Randolph has published in many journals including Qualitative Inquiry, Urban Education, Educational Studies, Journal of School Leadership, and History of Education Quarterly. Dr. Randolph is a member of many professional organizations and has served in many leadership roles, including as president of the History of Education Society. Given the current climate, let's start by having our panelists speak about why we study race. Let's start with Ada, and then we'll hear from Adrian and Emmanuel. Ada? Uh, thank you, Sarah, for that introduction, and welcome to this, uh, Pam, the fifth of the six series to everyone listening. Um, that is a really interesting question, and it's a key question, I know, for me. When I think back to my undergraduate education, actually, at the University of Iowa, and I was in an ed psych class, and I was the only African-American in the class. But the professor said a comment that I just will never forget. And he said that Black people don't care about education. 
And I kind of looked around at everyone in the classroom and thought, did he just say what I heard he, he said? Because what he had said was all these pre-service teachers, of course, including myself. And I was like, did he just say that black people don't care about education? Where does he get that from? You know, it didn't speak to my family's experience, having had a grandmother that attended Tuskegee and grandfather university, my father, having gone to Philander Smith and several siblings, having gone to different PWIs or predominantly white institutions. It just didn't speak to my experience. And I wondered what the impact was of that categorical generalizable statement to the other pre-service teachers in the room and how they would take that notion into the classroom. So that kind of began my whole um, reason to start studying race and how how people make comments or just uh, statements about race, but there's no research to really back that up. Uh, and, and so that just kind of started me on my way to studying race. So for me, when I start thinking about this topic, um, I think it becomes really challenging um, as a mental health provider. That's kind of been my background and my emphasis. So as a mental health provider, much of what we know about mental health, wellness, the ways in which we have devi defined health and wellness have been in largely Eurocentric ways. And so thinking about the ways in which we talk about diagnosis, assessment, treatment planning, um, school-based education, interventions, social emotional learning, all of those are based on a Eurocentric model. And then applying that within a school system, a mental health system that has incredible inequities related to race means that we're trying to apply a solution that doesn't necessarily fit the population. And so when I think about why I study race, it's connected to the ways in which we provide services as mental health providers, school counselors, whatever our lane is. Um, but that's really kind of the emphasis for me. Yes. Um, thank you very much, Abda and Adrienne, for your perspective on that. I, I, I think what I'm going to say is something that I share with my students all the time. It always bothers me to uh, talk about race in the context of black and white, um, Hispanic, etc., because like other. Uh, my um, first exposure with the concept of race is in one of my anthropology, physical anthropology classes, like probably 27, 20 years ago now, uh, when I realized that race is not a biological thing. It is a social construct. But the, the concept of black and white that we have now was a, a social construct, you know, based on an economic purpose to expand the colonization of um, Africans by Europeans and to expand slavery. And, and, and so they use, they manipulate science to create the notion of the superiority of one race over another one. And they started to um, well, talk about blacks and whites. But it's important to understand that until the 18th century, this concept, you know, were irrelevant. You, uh, uh, the categorizations used to be Africans, uh, Caucasians, mm -hmm. Europeans, et cetera, et cetera. So this is why it's bothered, not because of uh, my race itself or other people's race, but when I know what was behind the creation of the concept of race. And it started with the economy first, and then politics and religion were used so, uh, to uh, reinforce that, and now it becomes more of a cultural concept. So uh, I, it's, I always have that in mind. Actually, I am, uh, a, a, that's part of the reason that I became vegan when I realized that race was used as a tool to assert the superiority of one group over another one solely based on their skin color when there is no uh, biological rationale for that except uh, you know, 
sociologico, economico e politico razionale. Um, I just like to follow up a little bit more on that as well, because I was a science, I was a future science educator. So the whole set, concept of race being genetic, of race being a biological construct is what I learned. But as I've grown in my own education, having earned my master's and consequently PhD, definitely it is a social, political, and historical construct. But the other piece of it is that we often think of it as black and white as this binary, and it's not a binary. Emmanuel's absolutely right with how they used to have categorizations about this race and that race, you know, Caucasoid, Africanoid, Mongoloid, et cetera. Uh, but it's a social, political, historical construct in terms of how it plays out. Uh, even this election has shown us that there's not, it's not a binary, but we keep shaping it, particularly in education um, as that binary, but it is not. Thank you all for that. Now a question, do you think there is an issue of misrepresentation or underrepresentation of black people in research? And how might this be explained? And let's begin with Adrian. So I think absolutely, there's a problem with that. Um, it's a tendency, it's a trend. And it, again, if we take it outside of its historical context, then it just seems sort of happenstance. But if you put it into its historical, cultural, histor uh, social context, then it makes sense. Of course, there's reasons why um, there's misrepresentation or why there's underrepresentation. When I think of misrepresentation, I think it becomes very easy to take numbers um, and then say, oh, well, look, they're underachieving here. So I don't know what the problem is with them. <laughs> when there's really no context of where these numbers might come from, um, what kinds of metrics we're using, what's the historical context, how do we situate these experiences, how do we situate these numbers? And I think that that's the importance of our role as researchers. If we don't recognize that we have an incredible power and authority in terms of the words that we say and the ways in which we frame and contextualize research, then we're doing a disservice. What we do is we contribute to this incomplete narrative um, that's had a long-standing history. Um, there's a video called, it's on PBS, um, my favorite, I was PBS rep, but in terms of that dynamic, um, it's called Race, the Power of an Illusion. And one of the things that they talk about was exactly what Emmanuel and Ada were referencing and that hierarchy. And amazingly, every country, every European country that did it would always have their country as the top of the best. And then always, one thing that was always consistent is that Black people were at the bottom every time, every time in that rank. Um, it didn't matter if you were talking about the French, the French would say they were the best, the Spanish would say they were the best, the British would say they were the best, but yet that problem of Blacks always being at the bottom, that's something that is a consistent historical narrative. So again, if we're going to either underrepresent the rich diversity of Black people's experiences, Black people's stories, Black people's identities, or um, not include them at all, we're just adding to the same problematic narrative that's been going on for hundreds of years. Emmanuel, would you like to add? Uh, yes. Uh... Uh, to go back to the question, is there an issue of under and misrepresentation of Blacks in research? And what might explain that? That's a, that's a dissertation question, literally. <laughs> yes. Um, actually, there is plenty of data to show that um, it, it's important for our viewers and audience to know that it, it, there is a federal mandate for uh, federally funded research to include minority underrepresented groups, including Blacks, but they are still underrepresented. Um, also, there is an underrepresentation in, in Black students in STEM careers also. Uh, but the underrepresentation is, is um, uh, there are some reason, reasons to explain that. Uh, 
and some the, some of the reasons have to do with the misrepresentation of black people in research. And um, we all are, you know, faculty and, and probably not everybody here, but, you know, we, we are aware of the concept of the LRB. It, it was created exactly because of the Tuskegee experience, because African-Americans, they were uh, manipulated and, and, and with um, uh, the syphilis, they, even when the treatment became available, they let them down to see how they would be going through to the process. And, and so, uh, you know, an experience like that, it created mistrust among African-Americans when you invite them to participate in research. I am originally from Haiti. I can tell you that in the 1982, 83, 84, 85, there is a, a virus now that we call it HIV AIDS. But in early years, the CDC, the CDC, the, the most prolific uh, research institution of the United States, they call it four H's. One H was for homosexuals, uh, the other H was for hemophilia, and the third H was for people who are a, a willing user. And guess what the four, fourth H was? It was for Haiti. And I'm talking about during the early 1980s. So here you are, a virus. Imagine that you have the coronavirus, and they said that it's, it is a virus that you can find only in a category of people. And at that time, you can imagine Haitians in, in, in the U.S., they couldn't go to a doctor, they couldn't go to the hospital, they got fired, nobody wanted to stay anywhere close to them. And until later on, the CDC, they realized that they made a mistake, but they manipulated science. And we, we, I don't think we have enough time to, to, to go about that. But it, 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 at that period, Haiti was the primary, the number one touristic destination because some homosexual people from California traveled to Haiti. So they learned that and they said the country is, is the virus. And, and it was not conspiracy theory, it was an official act of the American government against an entire population. So you understand that people, they develop mistrust about things like that. And, and, and there is a lot of, I, I used to uh, work in, I was research coordinator for a, a study on posted cancer when I used to work in public health, it was a struggle to recruit African-American males to participate in research re related to colorectal cancer, to posted cancer, because they were afraid if uh, data collected on them will not be used for criminal investigation, et cetera. And, and, and so that, that mistrust uh, contributed to underrepresentation, but also the misrepresentation of black people contributed to that as well. And uh, the other aspect that I would like to touch quickly, I, I mentioned uh, the, the underrepresentation of um, blacks in STEM careers. And we are in a college of education. Science teachers research, there is a tons of studies that show that science teachers have a lot to do with that because they have a higher expectations of, of black students, of, of white students compared to black students. So, so therefore it becomes a self-fulfilling you know, prophecies. And some studies that, um, uh, that were based on minority girls, they say that the assumptions about STEM careers, it is white, it is male, it is middle class. So, it, it, it's it's not for them. So when you have these things going on, uh, and they are still going on, it's it's understandable why you have underrepresentation uh, of uh, black people uh, in research and even in in, in um, 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 some studies. When when they start the study, there are some minorities that are included, but uh, when they reach the third phase of the study which is the most critical phase, most of the minorities are removed from, uh, from the study. So it's, it's still an ongoing issue and it's relevant right now, given the situation of the COVID-19 that we are struggling with. Mm -hmm. 
And okay, so the question of misrepresentation, uh, underrepresentation, misrepresentation, because there's a norm that we're not talking about here. And the norm is that everything is based on Eurocentrism. It's based on the idea that the white is the center of the earth, and meaning that everything else from below that. And the, the example Adrian gave, whether regardless of what kind of European they were, they were the top and African was the bottom. And again, it's not a binary, because this applies to Native American, indigenous people, Latinx people, Asian people. So this, but the norm has to overwhelmingly stay white, quote unquote, people. So when you have that as the norm that no one's ever disentangling or attacking, misrepresentation is always going to happen because you haven't identified what you say the norm is based on. So underrepresentation, I think about that in my own experience. And of course, I think about it in looking for articles when I was writing my dissertation or even when I started doing research in undergraduate school about Black people, there was little or scant often is the word that comes to mind in terms of finding sources that did not present the images or the life experience or the history of people of African descent across the diaspora as deficit or as, um, what's the other word, not compensatory or um, just wrong. So, but what they didn't say was the norm was white people. So they were juxtapositioning Irregardless of where you come as a person of color against this norm of white people is saying this is the standard that everyone must meet. And as Adrian talked about earlier, there's different cultural, historical, et cetera, experiences. So how can you take a norm and say everyone has to meet it when the norm is only based on one group? That's the question. And I was a Holmes scholar who was a member of the Holmes group. And I'm a Holmes alum, always a scholar, you know, always once a home scholar, always a home scholar. And that organization created that group in direct criticism of the fact that they weren't looking at improving um, the professoriate of underrepresented groups, Asian, African, Latino, et cetera. So they created that group to, to, help, to, uh, to help to change the underrepresentation of minority scholars in higher education. And actually, I can say that I believe it's probably the best thing that they ever did in terms of who have come out of that group and who have gone on to make a change in higher education. So they recognized it, but if that doesn't speak to our own experiences while we were seeking those degrees. But so we could be misrepresented. And I think often also finally, of Carter G. Wilson's book, Miseducation of the Negro. And he kind of covers the same thing about race and how everyone studies everybody else's greatness, like people of color or people of African descent created nothing, which we know is untrue. But it was the always juxtaposition against whether they're, whatever the group is, is against this white norm that never changes. Yes, if I may. Yes, please, Emmanuel. Yes, um, and, and I, I agree with what I, I said. And actually, one thing that I would like to add is it's unfortunate uh, we are talking about underrepresentations of Blacks in research because it shouldn't be a discussion for us to have. The reason that we are having it is because of what um, the Middleton talk about in the intro. It's, is because of structural racism. It's because these people, they have been marginalized in terms of access to healthcare services and, 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 and some opportunities so that uh, they are prone to certain diseases at, at a higher proportion compared to other population. And, and so when it's not because they are different, but uh, because of the experience of sexual racism, when they are not represented in the study, so the analysis do not account for them. And, and if they were not marginalized, it wouldn't be any problem at all. Uh, there are some countries where that are homogeneous society, they do not talk about underrepresentation of a particular category. But because the US is a diverse country, 
it is important that you know studies in every aspect of society you know account for the diversity of people who are part of uh, that society and 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 that country. Thank you, Emmanuel. We have our first audience question, and I would like to um, ask Ada to answer it first before we move on to the other panelists. Okay. The question is, how do we begin to tackle racism in our education system? It feels like such a huge issue to tackle. Ada? Yes. <laughs> Uh, you always have to work in where you are planted. You know, you grow where you're planted. So you have to look at it as Dr. Middleton gave it that first in the introduction to the series. There are multiple levels. Choose what's going to work for you, where you can feel like, OK, I can do this as an individual. I can do this as a collective part of a group or I can do this more structurally. Pick something and just do it. So, so don't think you have to think about the whole, any piece that moves us forward, moves us forward. Uh, we always talk about the more arm of the universe being bent towards justice, as Martin Luther King said. So pick where you want to make the system more equitable, more just, more um, inclusive, um, and then work there. Thank you, Ada. Adrian. So the first thing um, is this question was posed, my response was head on, like we tackle it head on. Um, I think one of the worst things that we do is we just sort of play games with it. Um, this might have been, or it could have been, might be related possibly to, and we do so much couching in gymnastics to try to get out of just saying, mm, how is racism operating here? And that's a question I keep saying, um, and I must cite Kamar Phyllis Jones, in terms of her way of asking that question at every interval, at every step in the educational process, as we see students being tracked into special ed, disproportionately students of color, as we see students of color being pushed out of the school system through suspensions and disciplinary actions, um, as we see teachers of color being demanded to do extra work and extra emotional labor, same thing with school counselors. First, we have to deal with it head on, but we also have to recognize at each level, every interaction, what are the ways in which racism is operating here? And I think that if we just get that started, um, that'll be that'll be a big step. And then we can build from there, just like Adam mentioned, figuring out where do I fit and then taking that step. And I'll turn it over to Emmanuel. Yes, this is uh, a, a $500 million question uh, because it is the question. And, and I, I would like to, uh share to people that if you if you do if you ever done statistics in your life you heard about regression and correlation you probably ask where i'm going with that uh, with the way i'm the place i'm going with it is to mention the person who invented uh who created regression is is a british uh statistician called galton is uh, we still use regression, but he is famous for something else that is called hygienic, uh, which is uh, public hygiene, health hygiene, and and you will see that as a positive thing. And um, this is the theory that explains that genetically speaking, white people have better genes than black people, and therefore they are uh, uh, inferior to white people, and. And if you study the history of the U.S. education system, you learn about Placey versus Ferguson, and you learn about Brown versus Board of Education. Guess what? The Asianics theory of Galton, it was the core argument that earned, uh, that, that, that led to the Supreme Court decision to say, yes, separate, but equal. And, and that was overturned by, you know, Brown versus Board of Education. The reason that I go there is, is to explain that there is something called scientific racism. And we're talking about the representation and misrepresentation of Black people in research. It starts there. And, and 
I am a, a scholar, I do research. All of us on the panels, we are scholars and we do research. We are the primary tools of in the, if you if you don't have a conscience, if you are not conscious of the bias that can be embedded in your research design, in your methodology, in the topic that you are researching on, in your publications, we fought the systemic, you know, racism that you know politicians use, policymakers use, that corporate use, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. For me, yes, I understand that we start with individual, but it's, I think that policy is the only thing that can change racism in the education system. So then policy can curb individual behavior so that people know that you don't track a, a, a black student, you go to a classroom, all the black students, you see them in the corner, uh, and, and because uh, they may, uh, uh, supposedly they are struggling and all the other ones, um, they are advanced, et cetera. And we, I'm talking about things that are currently happening in our own school district around here. So, and these are, you know, policy decisions, but also these are school principal decisions. These are teachers' decisions as well. So it goes on often, but I think the biggest chunk is policy, but also like Ada and Adria mentioned, you need individuals to, uh, to be aware of how their scholarship and their decision-making process all the way throughout the structures influence and, and continue to perpetuate, you know, structural and, and systemic uh, racism in, in schools, and they are reflected in outcomes. And the other thing about that, Emmanuel, if I could just follow up a little bit, is that we all research from our own positionalities. There's no such thing as bias. There's no such thing as adjectivity. We have positionalities, which means it's something that we can keep check on, that we can be clear about, that we can be transparent about. So when you were talking about those lawsuits, I thought about you know Roberts versus Boston, which was the first suit of, to desegregate the schools in 1855 in Boston. And basically the premise was, of course, black kids can't go to school with white kids. And we often think of Brown, which is 100 years later, as the seminal case. But as we decided 100 years earlier in 1855, we just chopped away at it. Even here in Ohio, they didn't do away with desegregated schools until 1887 with the Arnett Law. So when we think about systemics, if I always tell students, if you determine the question, you determine the answer. So what is the basis of your question? And that's where researchers, educators, policymakers have to think about what's the basis of this question? Why do I have this question? And what things are hidden here that I'm not asking of myself to explicate with, um, you know, implicitly that are implicit that I need to explicate explicitly. Thank you all for your um, response to that question. And please, uh, feel free to continue adding um, questions to the chat. We have our second audience question, and I'll ask Adrian to address it first before moving on to others. The question is, how have you seen racism work its way into the research process? I think there are so many ways that that happens, and I think it starts with Ada's point of positionality. One of the things that um, I talk about with our students is when you are looking at research, it's very important that like the method is very important, literature review, all that's important. But what I always find interesting is when the conclusions have almost no context to them. It's just here, we've reported our results and our conclusion is this is it. Very basic. Um, and a, an example of this, and this is using a content analysis, so it's not really focusing specifically on any group. But it's a study where they did a 10-year content analysis of counseling pedagogy. That's That was the focus. And one of the things that they commented on, um, and you know when anybody starts with saying something like, we don't want to discount the importance of something, they're about to discount the importance of whatever that thing is. And that was pretty much how that went. So they said, we don't want to discount the importance of multicultural counseling. We don't want to discount that. However, we found a disproportionate number 
oh, almost two thirds of the articles within this time period focused on this topic. And we think that's just a lot. And that, that makes sense. Yes, there's a lot. However, it's also important to note that from the time that they started this content analysis, the multicultural competencies had only first been enacted four years prior, and it was just getting streamlined into education. And so then to say, well, this is too much. Well, it didn't exist for 50 years of research prior to that. So yes, there was this incredible burst of new interest in this topic because we finally had competencies. This was becoming a mainstream issue. And so to simply just look at the numbers and make a determination of this is over-representation, I think that's problematic. And so to Ada's point, when we talk about positionality, I think people only talk about it when it comes to um, qualitative research. And that should be a part of all of our research. When you are doing quantitative research, you still have to be thinking about the questions that you're asking, because as both of uh, my colleagues have mentioned, we have a historical process of undermining, dismissing, or oversimplifying people of color in research. And so I think that when it comes to addressing this issue in the research, positionality is the starting point. And the next piece of that is really at every step of the research design, asking important questions. Thank you, Adrian. Um, Aja, I think that you're going to address this next, but I wanted to um, repeat the question since it's a new one. How have you seen racism work its way into the research process? Um, there's a concept I heard this weekend from Dr. Yoon Pak at um, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and her presidential address at HES this uh, summer, this this past weekend, but she's she gave this concept of we often think of colorblind. Oh, you know, I'm not racist, or you know, I don't see color, etc. But it's not that you're colorblind; you're racist blind. You're not examining your own positionalities and how you are approaching what you're approaching. So consequently, it's unconscious, and you just move it right along because it's numbers. Oh, I'm objective. Well, not necessarily, because again, as a quantitative methodologist, I don't believe in objectivity. Uh, even as a historian, I no longer believe in objectivity. I think the data is the data, and it's how we read and analyze that data, what theoretical framework, um, what non-theoretical framework, or whatever we use, conceptual framework, is where that comes in. And oftentimes, if we're if we're looking at these groups, you know, again, if we're choosing binary or if we're choosing multiple groups against this one group, we're not, we're not asking ourselves, why is this the norm? Why is it how I'm judging everybody else and everything else against this norm that I haven't questioned? You know, so that's how it gets in there. It's everywhere. And it's up to us to unroot it and really ask ourselves some critical questions. For example, you know, the current president of the United States just kind of put a block on funding research that is critical race theory based without any understanding of what that means. And so, and I saw it already manifest itself at an NEH workshop I went to, which specifically said, oh, don't, don't put any positionalities in there. Don't put any, don't say any critical race theory. They didn't say that, but they implied it. We should let, because research is a political act. And we forget the funding of research, what gets accepted for publication, what gets um, you know, fostered as good research. If we go back and look at it, it's mostly about white people. And we're, we're, not, we're not talking about that. We, we, it's only we bring up, only bring up race when we talk about people of color. But we don't bring up race when we talk about white people and it's all about white people. Well, white's a color too. It's in a Crayola box as well. So we have to disentangle again, what is we saying is the norm and how is that showing up and how we're constructing our research? Thank you, Ada. Um, Emmanuel, would you like to respond to this question? Yes, and, and I think it's a, it's a fundamental question. I, I, I touched a bit on it earlier, but I, I would like to just quickly um, reaffirm what Adrian and Ada said, positionality is, is a starting point. But there are some other key pieces as well. And um, the other Ada mentioned 
um, uh, publication, you know, uh, outlet that can access your, your, your manuscript. But the other piece is funding. Uh, it, it, there is, uh, you mentioned the NIH earlier. The, in 2011, there was a study that showed that uh, African Americans and Blacks, they receive uh, disproportionately uh, a lower level of, of funding compared to their white counterparts when they applied for NIH grants. And the NIH, they created a commission to address that. But the recent studies show that the, the problem still exists and still persists. And, and, and part of the reason that happens, uh, some of the explanation that the NIH provided in the recent study is that Blacks, they, are, they, they, they apply for funding to do studies that can uh, improve the welfare of their communities and minority communities. So this uh, doesn't get funded because it is not part of the strategic programmatic area of, of the NIH. And it, it doesn't happen just at the NIH. It happens at institutional level, in universities, in, 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 in the grant funding agencies, nonprofit organizations. It's, it's a pervasive issue. If some studies, you cannot conduct them, if there is no funding for them. And also there is another issue, it's framework. A lot of the frameworks that we use, we all do respect you know, to all of you, et cetera. They are Western-based frameworks, Europeans, American, et cetera. So therefore the frameworks, they are based on specific tendency regularities that are part of a, a, a colonial discourse. So I, I, if when you use post-colonial alternative discourse, it's, um, it, it's always being challenged. It's kind of something on the margin. So therefore that affects dissemination. But ultimately the other piece is consumption. Whoever funds a piece of research is one of the primary consumers. So alternative research sometimes they have a very a, a smaller pool of consumers, one because of the topics, uh, because of the target populations, if they happen to be minority population, except for folkloric consumption. And, and so therefore the entire process, throughout the process, there are ways to, um, to, uh, to kind of uh, uh, perpetuate uh, the, the racism and sexual racism uh, uh, throughout the entire research process. Uh, it doesn't mean that there are no opportunities to get away uh, out of that trap. Uh, some scholars, they said, well, I'm going to do alternative research anyway, uh, but they accept to be punished uh, for that. And, and sometimes this is at, at the only price that uh, alternative and minority research can be uh, uh, can get out of of the bubble and and get disseminated to a larger audience. Thank you, Emmanuel. Adrian, did you have a follow up? I did. Something that was coming up as both Ada and Emmanuel were talking, I was really thinking about something that is probably a favorite concept of mine. When we talk about the normal curve, it's it's so fun. It's so basic. We all know it. You get it in undergrad. But what becomes really limiting, and this is speaking specifically to what Ada brought up, is you're looking at any variable and we're looking at comparing Black people to white people along these same means. And then we say, well, there are two standard deviations above the, on this group. And if we're only looking at it in this comparative way, we're doing such a disservice to the entire normal curve of black people or the entire normal curve of white people. And I tend to go more quant. That just, I like the, I like the numbers. They make me happy. But when we think about how our style is, I find that what becomes the most difficult in, in quantitative research is we're comparing two completely different populations with di completely different histories. We're missing the range of experience. The other thing that I find is that, and this is to um, Emmanuel's point related to regression, is 
we're trying to predict things in often very linear ways. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we know is that human experience is not linear, nor is it univariate. Let's start there. Um, and so when we start thinking about these from these very, very narrow um, frameworks of what research can do without really addressing some of the richness of experience, for me, that's a part of why I've shifted from looking at doing quantitative research or qualitative research to doing a lot more mixed. That has really shaped a, a different, a totally different way of thinking about research, mixed methods and multimodal. Um, it's just really shift. Multi-method research has become something that's very interesting and creates ways to sort of, it doesn't automatically combat racism in research practices, but it can allow for a more rich and diverse story to be told. And I think that that's a starting point for us as well. Yeah, I would like to add something quick. And, and um, Ada mentioned earlier about the manipulation of data. And I think uh, it is something that is true in uh, quantitative research and research that claim objectivity. <clears throat> I, I, the, the person that came to my mind quickly is a guy called Charles, uh, 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 Charles, uh, Charles Murray. He wrote a book, The Bell Curve, where he used a lot of uh, fuzzy math, fuzzy statistics, fuzzy demographics, and to prove in his work that white people have higher IQ than black people. And this is part of a longer history. If you go to uh, Gobino, what about the inequality between uh, races? And, and I, I mentioned uh, Galton earlier, you're talking about uh, Darwin and all the philosophers who created Western civilization. I'm talking about Hegel, uh, who, he said that, you know, the, 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 the Africans, they were savages. And the entire, you know, foreign policy of the United States is driven not by policymakers, not by diplomats, but by anthropologists, sociologists, who travel to African countries, to other countries, to do ethnographic studies, to study this population, and then develop policies to control them, to manipulate their internal policy, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, uh, it, 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 there is a lot there. Mm -hmm. And um, what Emmanuel has said taps into this whole idea of decolonizing methodologies. Uh, Dr. Linda Tawahi Smith, as well as many others, have begun to question those very implicit ideas that are often unquestioned in our methodologies. So we can't. Again, again, what am I judging this person against? You've got a norm. So what is that norm? And that norm has often been, when it comes to people of color, Western ideas. And it's not wrong to have the Western ideas. It's wrong when you place a value judgment on, on it and then say, this group is deficit. This group is less than. This group cannot compete. And then people consequently act on that because they, the researchers have said it. You know, we carry a lot of weight as researchers. So it's more, we should take the responsibility of understanding how the audience is going to respond to our research. They're gonna respond how they respond, but at least we have to disentangle again, what are my inherent positionalities in this piece? So we have to decolonize our methodologies because all of us have been trained in Western ideas of viewing stuff. It's only when we come back and say, wait a minute, again, I go back to my ed psych class. Well, that's not true. That's not true about Black people. Where's the data for that? But if you believe that, and then you construct some research that reifies that, it started with the belief, not with the data. It started with the belief where you been, then went, go ahead to prove your belief. And again, you could have screwed the data, so on and so forth. So. Thank you all. And thank you um, to the audience member for posing that and keep submitting um, questions for the panelists. Now, um, I have a next question, and I would like um, to ask Ada to start up to talk to start us off on it. Okay. And the question is, are there biases associated with the perception of black scholars or black related scholarship? You know, I reject the word biases. I call it the B word. Uh, there are beliefs, there are positionalities. 
It's not like you can do away with your biases. You have to be aware of them, first of all, and that they exist. So the whole concept of bias to me is something that I kind of like, uh, to the B word. Let's talk about people's positionality because everybody has one. And just a short story, when I was finishing up my PhD at The Ohio State University, my advisor, Gail McCutcheon, Dr. Gail McCutcheon said to me, well, you know, if you study black people, people are going to pigeonhole you. At the time I'm like, what? I didn't really try, I didn't really understand what she was trying to say to me because I made it clear to her from the beginning to the end of my dissertation process, I'm here to examine the lived reality of black people, historically, contemporarily, et cetera. So she was trying to tell me people would look at me a certain way because that was my chosen, my chosen um, um, you know, field of specialization, what I wanted to be the expert in. And at the time I was like, yeah, it's okay, because I'm, I'm cool with that. <laughs> you know, I'm cool with them seeing me as a person who is such an African-American experience. But what she was trying to hit me to, so to speak, was the politics of that and how my colleagues and other people in the institution would view it. Not how, how she wasn't trying to change how I felt about it. She was trying to make me aware of the politics of research, that others would look at my research and see it as less than or not as competent as, or not as rigorous as others because of the topic of the focus or the centering of the black experience. So I'm trying to remember the second part of the question. So is there is there a positionality that people take? Yes, and she was absolutely right. But again, I was new. I didn't really understand the politics of research and how it played out, but I've come to experience that. And where I see it the most played out is in tenure and promotion decisions. When I see people in the room who begin to question the outlet that this researcher, particularly if they're a person of color, well, they're a person of color, where they've published, you know, why they focused on this. So that's where I begin to see when the colleagues in the room ask questions that I've never heard them ask of my white colleagues. And I'm like, OK, you're being blind racist here, uh, but they don't know that they, they, they are so unaware they're asking different questions of scholars who focus who are African or Asian or whatever, or and if their topic is related to who their their own identity, they're questioning in a way that I never see them question when it's a white person doing research about white people. And I'll end there and let others address it. Thank you, Aja. Thank you for that. Um, Emmanuel, I'm going to ask you next to talk about um, biases associated with the perception of Black scholars or Black-related scholarship. Yes, I, I think um, it's both. Um, it, like Ada said, it's 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 a bias, but it's more than that. It can be a belief. Uh, but I will pick up to the last thing that uh, Ada said is the word unconscious, because when people grow up in a society with history of racism, with educational institutions, with structural racism, uh, with, with uh, family members, where when they meet at the Thanksgiving dinner, when, when, when there's nobody around and, and, and things are being you know, talked about, and, and when they go to worship on Sunday, uh, they are worshiping a God that is different from the God of these other people, even if they carry the same Bible. Um, it becomes a mindset. And, and sometimes people are not even aware of that. And, and so they start uh, questioning uh, topics and, and research interests. Uh, because of a lack of awareness of the relevance of these topics, because they are not part of the primary universe. And that's one thing that I, I, I hope that people can get into that. It, it's the idea is not to kind of say, uh, you know, you, you, you are necessarily bad, but it means that sometimes you can unconsciously exhibit your, your, your bias, your, your beliefs, uh, uh, in ways that you are not even aware of it. And, and so open-mindedness is the way 
you know, exploring our audience is a way to kind of uh, challenge that. And and I I have um, the same experience as other, but in a different way, in the sense that in many U.S. institutions, uh, or faculty are expecting you, if I am originally from Haiti, uh, to do a dissertation based on the country where you are coming from, because there is already a box that is created for you. That's that's all you can do, and and it's 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 more of a in a, in a more folkloric uh, way, and 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 I see I, I saw that happening with uh, my colleagues from African country, etc. And so I became very vocal about that. And for people who know me, I I've been um, I'm if I have to speak, I will speak regardless. I I that's one thing I I have never been afraid of, and it's part of the history of the country that I am from. And I said, if this is the expectation, then I'm going to defy that expectation. And and so I, I had my, I had my own personal research interest. You cannot define that for me based on where I'm from, based on who I am. And and obviously, uh, sometimes it works for some students. All the time, they have to pay a heavy price for that in dissertation. Committees, but also for scholars, uh, certain scholarship uh, people put see them and they put question mark on them because of who the scholar is and not what the study itself is is about. And again, like I said, because of the frame of mind of people, because of where they are coming from, because of the overall socio and cultural background, which informs. All uh, our worldview, our beliefs, our, our decision making process, our decision, um, etc. Thank you, Emmanuel. Adrian. So, as Emmanuel was talking, something that I wrote down um, that he said was because Black people are essentially not in their primary universe, which I'm going to have to borrow from here on out. Um, <laughs> if they're not a part of your primary universe, then it's very easy to just sort of continue to relegate Black people and other people of color to the margins. And my response to that when it comes to how um, scholarship about Black people, Black issues is perceived is if, if we can understand the margins, do you know how easy it is to find the center and to understand the center? Um, and so by focusing on these margins, we really get so much insight as to what's happening in that reference group too. Now, what, where I think that that can go awry um, is I've seen people sort of almost cash in on studying people of color um, as a way to sort of make sure that they can check the anti-racist box or ensuring that they've got, they've, they've connected themselves in the right ways to the right topics or right issues politically. But yet I see that being viewed sometimes differently when it's um, scholars of color focusing on issues of color. Uh, one of the things that I think is really important is, and I've seen this happen in comprehensive exam meetings, I've seen this happen in um, or oral defenses or in just research discussions. A again, that issue of bias and objectivity. And almost always objectivity is defined in some distant kind of white way of being where this is the relationship to the data this is the relationship to the process it's very distant and i think that that is inherently problematic because it assumes it again reinforces the power structure um it reinforces the power structure and it creates a scenario in which experiences that are connected to actual communities are um discounted and I think that it's not just a thing that we as researchers see, but participants know. And I think that's one of the things that really bothers me about this is participants are not stupid. And I think the fact that they are frequently reduced to these stupid people that we're just studying is offensive and frustrating. Because when I say that I had doing, I was doing a research study on black counselors, wellness and coping. And I had a participant call me, a potential participant, and his, he said, who are you? And what is your background? 
And I was like, hi. <laughs> um, but he said, I'm just curious because I know that white people really love to study black people and then they get to take credit and add to their CVs about who we are. And I don't want to participate in that. And it was my, myself and another black woman colleague who we both center race in our practice and our research and our teaching. And that's what we talked about for that conversation. And I was so glad that he called because it was almost a, like, I knew that people knew how this goes, but for a participant to say this, or at least a potential participant to say this, that said so much to me because Pete, like, I, I really do think that we sort of in our little academic space that we believe is better than every other space, <laughs> um, we sometimes minimize the realities and the sort of the, I, I hate to say intelligence, but that's the only word I can use, the intelligence of the people who we have as participants. And I'm like, no, they are participating in our research and should be informing our research. And so then I started thinking about how am I presenting my information? What are the ways in which I can better um, address the purpose of my research? So for me, that informed how I thought about myself as a researcher. Um, but I think that it's important that we remember that this is not just about us and our work. There are people's lives that we're representing. We're telling other people's stories. And if we are doing that just to get the extra line on the CV without any context, any connection, Objectivity is almost the most frustrating word in the world to hear as a researcher because it almost always sounds ridiculous. Mm -hmm. uh, and I should probably stop there. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Comments. Uh, I'm sorry, Adop, please continue. No, good comments, Adrian. It, it brought me back to a couple of things as well, and I'm trying to keep them together in my head. But one of them is the personal is political. You know, Audre Lorde's mantra. And we often forget that the reason why people engage in research is something personal, you know, and it could be just putting a line on their CV, you know, in terms of getting tenure, but not really invested in, again, how people in the larger audience view, particularly people of color, if that's what our research is about. But I also think there's this idea, because I research people of African descent, that I don't know nothing else. And I'm an interdisciplinary scholar. I'm a historian, a quantum methodologist, and I'm a scientist. So I'm an interdisciplinary scholar. I just love to learn. So when people don't hear me in meetings, it's because they think, oh, she only knows about Black people. When I say something and then someone else will say the same thing I just said, and I'll be like, didn't I just say that? But it's because it's coming from a white person who automatically assumes, yes, they know because they're not studying about race. And but it's that it, it gets bothersome with it in terms of how we practice this amongst ourselves and how we legitimate some faculty when they say something, but we delegitimate other faculty because again, they only study race, which is just not true. Again, as Adrian said, we have to look at the center first, you know, as a historian. I'm gonna go look and see what the white people say first. And then I'm gonna go see what the black people said about their lived experience. I have to always do that. So that's just my little bit onto that. So throwing it back to you, Sarah. Thank you, Ada. Emmanuel, you had some follow-up as well. Yes. Um, my follow-up is that somebody might, might be uh, asking, um, why is that relevant? And, and I can tell you why is, when science says something, whether it's factual, whether it's true or not, people believe it. And I gave you several examples of when science got it wrong about black people. And I have receipts for that. When scholars publish things, people put credits into that. And we, we just had an election. We see how many people can believe quickly in conspiracy theories. They can believe in lies. They know it's a lie. They acknowledge it's a lie. They believe in it. They hang on it. So it's even worse when you provide them a scientific argument to justify why they think that they are superior of another person because of the color of their skin. It's even worse when 
when they have a tool to say that this kid, because of the color of their skin, it can be successful, that other one cannot be successful. Like I mentioned earlier, teachers' expectations uh, is a good predictor of student success from, uh, um, uh, from high school to college. And there is plenty of studies that show that. And so it, it is important that we increase our awareness about that and, and that uh, we are part of what is going on as educators, as uh, education administrators, as higher education administrators, as policy makers. And, and sometimes some people are very uh, conscious about it and because they have a white supremacist view, so they are for the agenda. But other times, people are unconscious about it. The people who are conscious about it, it's one situation. The one who are unconscious about it, I think we can do something and with them. And, and I used to hear that people say, uh, uh, well, uh, this is all about the, uh, the older people. This is about the grandpa and Thanksgiving. But guess what? In the last election that we had, surveys like uh, um, uh, uh, data collected showed that a majority of white males under the age of 30 voted for a white supremacist agenda. And so it's, it is not something that is going to stop just because we have a conversation about it now. It's not something that is going to stop when we have a new generation. It is something that is embedded in the society and is being passed from one generation to the next. And some of these people, they are our students, they are faculty, they are staff, they are service providers because these white supremacist groups, they recruit in high schools, they recruit in universities, they are on our campus, they are in our high school, and we know them, and, and they will continue to further that agenda. So it's important that there is more of us to counter less of, this, less of them so that we can have a more balanced and a more equitable society. Otherwise, uh, we will still have in that conversation uh, that give the impression that we are whining, et cetera, but it's a relevant issue because it is at the core of what it means to have a healthy community, a healthy society. The American psychological societies express that clearly that if there is data that showed the impact of racism on the psychological, physical, emotional being of people who are continually on a daily basis uh, bombarded with uh, uh, racist behavior and, and racism experiences. Thank you. So I want to ask um, one final question with the few minutes that we have left. And I'm going to ask Ada to address this first. The question is, are there examples of policies that can help address systemic racism regarding Black scholars or studies concerning Black people? Mm. Um, that's an interesting question because the reality is that our policies are supposed to be non-discriminatory. So we have policies. That's not the issue. I, I think we think about the affirmative action uh, policy, but the reality of the affirmative action policy is that more white women benefited from affirmative action than any other group. So you can have policies that seek to historically redress, you know, discrimination because uh, discrimination somebody's going to benefit and somebody's going to not benefit. Same thing with racism, somebody's going to benefit, somebody's going to not benefit. So the policies I think are there. I think the question comes to: Are people really willing? to do the individual work that's gonna make them examine how they make their decisions. Are they making their decisions based on what they know and understand? Or is it just their implicit bias or that they're not examining? People have to be willing you know, to do the work you know, because the policy is there. And I'll go back to my example I shared in the, um, in the other session in that when I was attacked with racism this past year, the policy is there. 
that the, fac the first person to address for a faculty for a grade grievance is the faculty member. I was never addressed at any point in that process. So the policy doesn't need to change. The policy is there. Everybody knows the policy. It's whether or not we're going to have the will to implement it. That's going to be the thing. Because the reality is, I think about Martin Luther King saying, it didn't cost white people much. They didn't have to give up anything. In fact, they gained because we got the, we, we spent our money in their institutions then. We became, we brought our brilliance to their institutions, so on and so forth. But it's not the policy so much. Yes, it's important to be there. We have it on the law, Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, but yet there's voter suppression. So it's, freedom is a constant struggle, but it, it always ultimately is going to come back as how that individual implements the policy. And whether or not they're going to have within themselves a reflective, reflexive conversation about what it is they're basing their decisions on. Uh, because the policies are there. We just need to implement them with justice and equity. And I would add to that, um, I think Adal brings up such an important point because policies, we have a lot of those. Everybody does our city training and they give you all this historical context about why you know, issues of inequity are present, how the ways in which we are ethical in our sampling procedures and our consent procedures, all of that's there. And you have to check off that you did that, right? But what's not happening, I think, is we see some significant gaps in training. That's one problem, is if positionality is not a part of all of our training in quantitative, qualitative, mixed, multi-method research, we're doing a disservice and we're setting up students and future researchers to believe that positionality is something that you get to do only in qualitative research. And so we're not asking them to become critical thinkers about the work that they produce. I think the other thing is connecting it to actual participants. Yes, we have participants who assist our research, but it's also important to think about what are they getting from this? And a $10 Amazon gift card is not it. So thinking about what are the ways in which we are using their time, their effort, their stories, frequently their pain, and are we just using that to add to our CVs or are we actually giving voice and sharing about these issues so that they can create policy changes within the communities and within the organizations or the practices that they're actually designed to inform? And I think the last piece of that is for us to really just be intentional across just our work of challenging one another. We have to be intentional scholars. We have to be a community of scholars that are not asking people to just explain why and what. Um, so why did you do this study? Well, why are you focusing on this group? Well, why, 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 why? Um, it is our job as researchers to contextualize but I think the interrogation is not a critical interrogation, it's just an interrogation <laughs> of why are you setting these, I mean, this is very narrow, but there's so much more to this discussion. And it's those conversations that I think really, it discourages future scholars from engaging in critical race research and critical race scholarship. So I think that it requires us really thinking at all levels. Yes, if I may jump in, I think that I uh, I concur with you, Ada and Adrian. Um, uh, policy exists; is policy implementation that is a problem. And the other thing that is a problem, there is a tiny word. It's called accountability. Also, is kind of a problem. So, um, having said that, I I still believe that from an institutional viewpoint, there are things that can be done, uh, such as funding for alternative studies or institutions can be intentional about uh, exploring like, and making an inventory of understudies area, understudied areas and say that we are going to uh, not necessarily make it the number one priority, but make it among the priorities that, that, that we have. Um, ongoing dialogue about these um, these issues, I think, can uh, help improve awareness. Because if you help, you know, two or three people become aware, that's it's uh, 
it, it's something you can multiply that. Um, um, but also the last thing that you mentioned, Adrian, is I, um, you know, 10, 12 years ago, when I was working in, in, in public health, as I mentioned, I used to be involved in community-based participatory research uh, in, in the Tampa Bay area, where we, we, the, we, we have what we call lay health workers. They are involved in the design of the study. We, we, we are you know, writing grants, proposal to submit the American Cancer Society to the NIH. They were involved in the design of the study, but that requires us to, we, we, we organize training for them to explain to them what is a problem statement, what is a research question, and what is the relevance of the research question. So they participate in that process. They, they, they provide letter of support. They participate in writing the grant proposal. Um, they, 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 con they, they contribute in the data collection process. And, and there is um, a, a portion of the, of the grant that is built for them to help them do uh, community activities because that's the very idea of community-based participatory research. It's a research study, but that involves some uh, project activities in the community. So it, it, they are not mere participants in the study. They are participants and researchers and co-researchers at, at the same time. But uh, this is more common in, in public health. Uh, it's, it's also common in community development because I've done some of these studies. Uh, I've been involved in some of these studies also with non-government organizations in Haiti. But, but in education, I think that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's probably uh, more of a tougher proposition. Having said that, institutions, like I said, can make a decision to say that we are going to explore alternative ways to provide you know, alternative funding for areas that have not been considered or uh, underlooked or neglected, and that our scholars, our researchers are interested in uh, conducting investigations in depth. Thank you, Emmanuel. We have one final question from the audience in the last couple of minutes that we have this afternoon together. Um, Ada, I would like you to answer first. And the question is, can research addressing the discussed inequities really impact students' attitudes? Yes. <laughs> uh, emphatic yes. And I'll just share a short story. Um, when I was teaching the race class and gender class or cultural diversity class, um, there's always a lot of pushback against that. But what I used for that class was thick, rich data. I used, you know, Takaki's A Different Mirror. I used um, Sonia Nito's Affirming Diversity. I used thick data from which to help students understand um, that this is a problem, that racism and all the isms are a problem in our school system. And often students came back to me and said, well, thank you, Dr. Randolph. That really changed my ideas about how structural, institutional, individual racism work. And I can be now reflective about my own practice as a future educator in making sure that I don't reify those systems of oppression. So I've seen it happen. Does everybody in that classroom go away? No, but that's not the point. If I got one, then I did my responsibility. And who knows that one will affect how many in society in general. So I think, yes, presenting the data, doing it through critical Socratic method um, can help students understand racism and all the isms and alter their thinking and hopefully their practices when they become educators. Thank you, Ada. Adrian. And I think in a similar way, when I do multicultural counseling or even a practical and internship class, being able to include and infuse research as a part of that, it shouldn't be this separate thing of we do actual teaching or, or excuse me, counseling. We do actual counseling or actual research. It's, it's not, it shouldn't be one or the other. The two should connect. Um, and that idea of a scientist practitioner, practitioner scientist, depending on your lens, um, psychologists and counselors tend to differ on that. Um, but I think that that's forcing us to realize, okay, this is not something that's happening in a bubble. This research isn't just something out there. It connects back to my 
classroom, if, I, if I'm working with school counselors, if I'm working with agency counselors to my agency or my community. And I think that creating that integrated process really helps it become normative. Yes. Um, in addition to what uh, Ada and Adrian mentioned, I think uh, there are uh, uh, other alternative methodologies like critical events, for example, uh, critical cases are examples of studies that can be done. Uh, but there is one, um, one of my idols, uh, Toni Morrison, uh, she advised to study the impact of racism on the experience of people who are perpetuating it. And, 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 and so my, my, my philosophy is that for we, have, we are having that webinar on Black Lives Matter. Uh, we've been having a lot of, uh, like probably five panels now with all Black faculty and staff and community members, et cetera. Uh, my hope is that we can be find ourselves in a place where we can have a Black Lives Matter panel, but having faculty, staff, and students and service providers who are not Black to talk about their experience internalizing racism, whether they are still struggling with it, how they cope with it, and what, what they plan to do to address it. Uh, because um, um, it, it, for me, it's, this is a part that, that I think that institution can do to study structural racism, not based on um, the quote-unquote literature that is out there, but from the experience of these people who are living with it, who grow up with it as children, and who are in position where almost every other day they are deciding, should I use that? That tool that I have in my toolbox, when can I use it? And, and I know it's a difficult conversation for some people to have, but, but I, um, Robin D'Angelo wrote an interesting book, uh, it's called White Privilege, that it may be a starting point that can, you know, uh, jumpstart people if uh, you invite them to, to talk about that experience. Because for me, it's part of the conversation to understand how people process that, to understand how people process hatred of other people and, 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 and help them become uh, more self-reflective of that, more conscious of that. And uh, just to follow up on that, Emmanuel, there are so many new scholarships out there developed by scholars of color as well as non-scholars of color to combat this issue. So when people sometimes ask me, where should I start? I'm like, do a search, do a search. I could easily hand you a bibliography, but if you're not vested enough to do your own search, it makes me kind of question whether it's the, it's, the, it's the popular thing to do or say, or whether or not you're really going to, again, have the action that is going to be anti-racist. that's at the core of your being versus the core of mine. So there are so many researchers, um, again, there's this one book, Seeing Race Again, um, Countering Color Blindness Across the Disciplines, you know, um, by Kimberly Crenshaw, um, Ian Harris, uh, Donna Mustang, and George Lipsis, who writes The Possessive Investment in Whiteness. His book is out in the, in the 90s, again, the scholarship is there. It's whether or not people are going to be willing to disentangle for themselves, you know, this unconscious piece of how they construct their research. And, you know, it's because it's out there. Linda Tawahi Smith, I mean, there was another book. So I would, I would just suggest that people look for the resources if they're actively seeking to change and question themselves, as well as how they construct their own classrooms. The research is out there. You just got to look for it. Adrian, so I'll go very, very briefly, but I think one of the 
um, critiques is that when we are presenting all this information that we're trying to present some kind of liberal bias or education that's leaning a certain way. But realistically, when we're talking about liberal education or liberal arts education, you're thinking about engaging with complexity, with a diversity of perspectives, connecting it back to civic and community engagement. And so those kinds of things mean that we have to not just think about data and just think about our practice, but again, we have to think about those things in meaningful ways. So when we're starting to provide data, I frequently will share news stories or I'll share examples of things, um, whether that be, okay, well, what, what, is, what do maternal nursery prisons look like within the state of Ohio? What does that look like um, when we're doing a developmental counseling class? Just so that we can start to think not just about what's happening in the universe out there in New York, but what's happening in Ohio and how does this connect to the actual content that we're doing and how might this connect to the children who have graduated from that prison nursery system and are now in my classroom as a school counselor. What am I doing? How do I connect all of that? So it really is this integration of connecting complexity to research to actual outcomes. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you all for that. So in closing, um, I'd like to thank the panelists for today's event, for sharing their time and expertise with us. And I'd also like to thank you, the audience, for joining us today. The evaluation for today's event is being placed in the chat, and we encourage you to take just a few minutes to give us feedback about your experience. Additionally, a recording of the session will be added to the Patton College YouTube channel by the end of the week if you'd like to rewatch the session or encourage your colleagues and others to view it. And the next event in the Patton College, College of Education's Black Lives Matter series will be held from noon to 1.30 on Monday, November 16th. And the theme for that event is anti-racism on campus, lifting student voices. Thank you again so much for joining us. Be well and safe. Bye.